Hi guys, you will not believe this, but it is an unbelievably spectacularly gorgeous day here in the end times in the former paradise of South Austin, Texas, here on this over-the-top beautiful Wednesday morning, November 29th, 2017, and the little Christmas elf and I need to get back. Jesus, day six of selling Christmas trees to clueless morons for the Optimist Club, where yesterday in Austin, Texas, we all agreed, I've been doing this off and on for 42 years. Yesterday, hands down, was the hottest day any one of us could ever remember uh, on a Christmas tree lot. I don't know what the temperature was in Austin, Texas uh, yesterday. And don't know if it was a record breaker or not, but it about gave me and the little dog sunstroke. So, anyway, before I dive back into watering Christmas trees, I sp we spend pretty much all day just watering the Christmas trees so all the needles don't burn off and fall onto the goddamn ground here on November 29th. But it being Wednesday morning, it is, of course, the day I bring you my climate change meltdown roundup rant, where I go on the mainstream media, particularly the science pages of the mainstream media, to see how this planet is heading directly into a burning lake of fire while I'm out hosing down, burning up Christmas trees in late November. Uh, would you not turn your back to the camera, please? And uh, there's just one problem. There aren't any climate change stories on the mainstream media. Well, there's plenty of climate change denying stories. I don't know who the new science editor is at Yahoo News, but this is some of the offerings from the science pages of Yahoo News. So the Alex Jones crowd ought to be having a... Uh, ought to be having a field day with the science pages from the mainstream media. They're going to start out with this, uh, this story from, uh, we're going to get back to this, from the Competitive Enterprise Institute by this climate expert that we'll talk about here in a minute, Robert Darwall from the Competitive Enterprise Institute showing up on the science pages of the mainstream media with his uh, on-point essay, A Veneer of Certainty Stoking Climate Alarm. In private, climate scientists are much less certain than they tell the public. So when I first opened this, what I thought is what this was going to be a story about was that in private, these climate scientists were saying, we are fucked. As there's many articles about this, I thought this was just going to be the latest in a long string of articles about the difference between what climate scientists are saying publicly, like, uh, what are they saying publicly? We're just, we're just a little bit under pressure, and then going home and saying, we are so fucked. But no, that's not at all what, what uh, what's his name, Rupert, is saying. So, I'm not, this is a long, involved story. I don't really know who the audience was for it, but basically what it's about is how climate science is unsettled. Yes, and um, so the, this essay explores the contrast between scientists expressions of public confidence 
and private admissions of uncertainty on critical aspects of climate science. Uh, yeah, so he's looking into this. Uh, instead of debating, highlighting, and where possible, resolving disagreement, many mainstream climate scientists work in a symbiotic relationship with environmental activists and the news media to stoke fear about allegedly catastrophic climate change. So what he does, I guess, is he's gathered together six supposed climatologists, three from each camp. So right off, he acts like he's starting off saying there is a 50-50 disagreement. That half of climatologists say we're not fucked, and half of the climatologists uh, say we are fucked. So anyway, if you want to hear the rest of this article, you can probably go over to the Alex Jones channel because my guess is that Lord Mockton is waving it around. But anyway, I just had to find out who is this climate scientist, Rupert Darwall, that the science editor at Yahoo News uh, thought was worthy of all this attention if I can uh, oh shit did I what did I do I went and, uh, and erased who the fuck Rupert Darwall is oh here's Rupert Darwall okay <clears throat> Rupert Darwall is, this is from the Competitive Enterprise Institute where Rupert Darwall does most of his work, they, uh, they describe Rupert as a strategy consultant and policy analyst. He, I love how they say this, he read economics and history at Cambridge University. He read economics and history at Cambridge University and subsequently worked in finance as an investment analyst and in corporate finance. And what he is, and he's an author of several of these uh, of these hilarious uh, climate change to mind. What he is is a professional, a professional climate change denier. That's what he is. And, but I'm more interested in who the hell is the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Hmm. Let's go over to Media Matters and find out what the media should know about the Competitive Enterprise Institute's regulation report. And one of the main things that anyone looking into them, maybe the editor of the science page should have checked in with this. CEI has been funded by the oil and pharmaceutical industry. So the good old Washington Post, what they did, uh, they had some fun with the CEI. So what they did is, is they went to a dinner by the CEI uh, and listed the donors. Anatomy of a Washington Dinner. Who funds the Competitive Enterprise Institute? So what they did, they broke down a $110,000 dinner that these guys, and here were the contributors. <clears throat> Murray Energy Corporation, $45,000. Marathon Petroleum, $25,000. Devon Energy, $15,000. Phillips 66, $10,000. Uh, 
American Coalition for Clean Coal, $5,000. American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers, $5,000. Emerson Electric, $5,000. <clears throat> the Canadian National Railway, the CSX Corporation, which had that big molten sulfur spill in Florida yesterday, throwing in $5,000. Don't forget Union Pacific throwing into the, uh, into the dinner. Here's the Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers. Ford Motor Company, Volkswagen. I think we get it. And this is who the science editor at and the mainstream media is uh, putting on uh, as a, an expert on climate change. Okay, I want to thank Sandy for sending me this story from, uh, from NBC. Uh, good old NBC. <clears throat> the climate is changing, but not just because of humans. Here's why that matters. Our culture of disaster, our culture of disaster has increased ideological semantics, but not informed decision making. Okay, take it away, Tonya Neves. So who the fuck is Tonya Neves? Uh, let's see, did I... Did I uh, run uh, Tanya's bio? Uh, Tanya Neves is the managing director for the Centers of the Public Service with George Mason's University School of Policy and Government. Blah, blah, blah. Her areas of research Communal Resiliency, Emergency Management, Law Enforcement, Traffic Safety, Survey Methodology. I I anyway, uh, I never see the word, as far as I can tell, Tanya has never uh, taken a climatology class in her life, but she wants us to know that the climate is changing. The thing is, it isn't just due to humans. Natural forces beyond human control are also gradually affecting our climate. These geophysical forces are vital to understanding global warming. Now, man is indeed responsible for a large portion, possibly even a majority of global warming. But also in play are complex gravitational interactions including changes in the Earth's orbit, axis tilt, and torque. So anyway, uh, you can imagine after the first paragraph saying that humans are probably responsible for the majority of the abrupt climate change going on on this planet. Then she spends the rest of this article, which is also being waved around by Lord Mockton on the Alex Jones channel. No doubt if you go over there, this NBC article will be uh, waved around how it is the, the tilt of the Earth's axis is the reason that uh, the, the uh, Christmas tree needles are burning off the trees in late November. That is the reason. It's the fucking earth is tilting 
That is why I'm going to go spend the next four hours watering down a bunch of dying Christmas trees. But anyway, guys, the main, uh, the single main article I wanted to talk about. I mentioned yesterday in my rant, I'm pretty much just going to sit here and read this. This is really the, the meat of the matter uh, from, this <clears throat> from this outfit called The Next Big Future by a fellow named Brian Wang. Who is Brian Wang? Brian Wang is a longtime futurist and author of some 8,000 articles. Uh, Brian has studied extinction risks in all of the current major causes of death and damage and how to mitigate them. Yes, he made a set of 156 predictions in 2006 for nanotech nanotech and many of his predictions for the five year or less time frame have proven to be accurate. Brian might be an interesting person for me to talk to, but what is on Brian's mind at the next big feature? <clears throat> and I'm going to repeat a little bit of uh, the, I read the first a uh, couple of graphs of this yesterday, so there will be some repeating here because this does bear repeating. More detailed analysis of the global warming fix. The global warming fix oh, come on, Mel. That, ain't even bullshit. That's that is 100 times cheaper and technically simple. And what are we talking about? What is Brian talking about? Stratospheric aerosol injection, otherwise known as chemtrails. One more time, this is the very article I have been predicting in the mainstream media for the past five years that uh, you will see more and more cheerleading of chemtrails on the mainstream media. Chemtrails are a foregone conclusion. Uh, so the Dane Wigington crowd will be vindicated in a few years. Okay, take it away, Brian Wang, you old futurist, and make another... He's not exactly making the prediction. I am. <clears throat> Stratospheric aerosol injection is an affordable and technically simple method of geoengineering. Using A balloons or drones, using A balloons or drones, lifting a hose into the stratosphere, or just modifying the fuel used in commercial planes would generate changes in the climate similar to a volcano. And then this is where they misspell volcanoes. So in two sentences, we have two uh, uh, grammatical spelling mistakes in two sentences. Okay, <clears throat> this approach, commonly known as chemtrails, we all know what the hell they're talking about, is technically simple. <clears throat> and 100 times cheaper than most other recommendations. And this is the operative sentence in this article. Whoever does not realize this, this is a time to peel back another layer of the chemtrail onion. <clears throat> this approach provides several more decades for the switch from fossil fuels to be globally implemented. This, well, I don't know, actually, I think that was the wrong button. 
This is the reason that the one of the reasons that the fossil fuel corporations are such cheerleaders of the Paris Climate Agreement. The Paris Climate Agreement has just baked into it geoengineering. Uh, it's just it's just assumed in the Paris Climate Agreement. And uh, are, are you starting to untangle this, guys? <clears throat> All right. The fact that this simple approach exists alongside other methods like using 10% of the ocean for the growth of seaweed means that climate doomsday is not going to happen. Come on, Neil. That ain't even bullshit. Technological interventions will be used. Warning, warning, bullshit alert. Okay. More detailed climate studies show that not only will the planet's surface temperatures be reduced with stratospheric aerosol injections, otherwise known as chemtrail engineering, but if preformed globally, if we can, if we can spray this shit all over the planet, can also reduce tropical cyclones. Delivery of precursor sulfide gases such as sulfuric acid, hydrogen sulfide, or sulfur dioxide by artillery, aircraft, and balloons has been proposed, and it presently appears that this proposed method could counter most climatic changes. Take, take effect rapidly. <clears throat> Have very low direct implement implementation costs. No shit, Sherlock. And be reversible in its direct climatic effects. Okay, uh, let's see, I'm picking one study found chemtrails to be economically, environmentally, and techni technologically viable. Such injections could provide could provide a grace period of up to 20 years before major cutbacks in greenhouse gas emissions would be required, the study concludes. No shit, Sherlock. Okay. Uh, all right, what are the arguments in favor of chemtrails. <clears throat> the arguments in favor of this approach in comparison to other possible means of solar radiation management are chemtrails mimic a natural process, meaning volcanoes, Technolo technological feasibility, uh, much of the required technology for chemtrails is already pre-existing. We already have chemical manufacturing, artillery shells, weather balloons, and airplanes. Okay. The cost is 100 times less than 
climate change impact and most other recommended mitigations. The low-tech nature, the low-tech nature of this approach has led commentators to suggest it would cost less than many other interventions. But most importantly, chemtrails would work. Yes. That is the most. Okay. So how will chemtrails work? Airliners could use lower quality sulfur rich fuels at higher altitudes. This approach would utilize regular airline flights and enable airlines to use cheaper fuels on long distance flights. This is a win-win situation for the global airline industry and the limp dick mainstream environmentalist clueless fucking morons swallowing one word of this shit. Okay. Enable airlines to use cheaper fuels on long distance flights. It would require using separate fuel tanks for takeoff and landing in populated areas due to the toxicity and olfactory sensations, otherwise known as the stink of sulfur oxides. <clears throat> <laughs> this can be achieved in many airlines without difficulty since they already have separate wing and fuselage fuel tanks. There you go. Civilian aircraft, including the Boeing 747, didn't they just ground the last Boeing 747? And the Gulfstream G550 could be modified at relatively low cost to deliver sufficient amounts of required material into the stratosphere. How about military aircraft such as the F-15 have the necessary flight ceiling? Military tanker aircraft also have the necessary blah blah blah. Oh God. And if you don't like airplanes, we always have high altitude balloons could also be used to lift the gases in tanks. Yes, uh, balloons can also be used to lift pipes and hoses. <laughs> oh God. And we wonder why we are so fucked. Anyway, uh, just a uh, uh, just a couple of more. Uh, if that's not enough, if while we're while we're figuring out chemtrails, the the folks at good old MIT are saying we don't have to worry about chemtrails because MIT researchers have figured out how to turn carbon emissions. Back into fuel. Come on now, that ain't even bullshit. That's bullshit. Factories and manufacturing plants power almost everything we do on a daily basis, but they also cause great harm to our planet by releasing tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Hmm. But MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has come up with the answer. They have actually come up with one of the wildest ways to do, do it. They've come across like perpetual motion. Just take the carbon pollution and turn it back in to usable fuel. Uh, da, da. And then uh, bringing up the rear of this, let's check in with those little limp dick mainstream environmentalists at HuffPost, the little lefties at HuffPost. 
the No Shit Sherlock Story of the Week. Take it away, HuffPost. Corporations make big climate promises only to retreat after a few years study finds. No shit, Sherlock. Billionaires, bankers, and corporate executives have trumpeted a new era of sustainable capitalism. Sustainable capitalism for years. Promising that advances in renewable energy and a rising generation of socially conscious tycoons would radically change an economic system addicted to fossil fuels. Wow. But new research published this month in the peer-reviewed Academy of Management Journal found that several big, big companies that had announced ambitious sustainability goals retreated from their promises when profits decreased or top executives changed. So uh, they break all this down. The bottom line, uh, the findings highlight the limitations of relying on market forces to combat climate change and the dangers of allowing corporations beholden to the financial interest of shareholders to shape policy. This is Christopher Wright, co-author of the study. There is so much hype about corporate good deeds that corporations will save us. It is so at odds with reality that it is pretty frightening. Anyway, guys, uh, except I, I, I had to go put my We Are So Fuck sign back in the truck because the owner of this house is, is back home and she does not allow the leave We Are So Fuck sign in her house. So you'll just have to imagine the We Are So Fuck sign. But with that, the little Christmas elf and I are packing up the gas-sucking truck one more time so we can get back to watering, burning up Christmas trees in the blinding hot sun of November 29th, 2017. Smoke them if you got them. We are so fucked. Are you ready to go? Back to the Christmas tree lot. I'm ready to get this hat off my head.